question maybe we should lock down here. So the question must be for us as Christians who want to worship God in 2021, because if you remember the last time we had a state lockdown, churches could not meet. We could not meet from March 16th until May 29th, two and a half months. But is, it, is there a biblical example where God's children were asked to quarantine? Well, the answer is yes. There are at least three places that I'm aware of where God told people to stay home, to not leave their chamber or leave their house. We're going to look tonight of how we can know it is God and why God would ask this. And is God asking it of us now? Or is there a lot of fear mongering? Is it the media hype? Is it government overreach? Is it Marxism and socialism and all these different isms that people are concerned is happening in our country and around the world? We're going to study scripture tonight from a place that is very familiar to many people, and that is the Passover and the 10th plague. We're going to study tonight two of the three that are mentioned in the Bible. We're going to look at Exodus, and we're going to look at when Assyria was going to conquer the northern kingdom of Israel, and God told his children to stay in their chamber, in their house, and not to leave. Is God asking us today in the midst of a global epidemic to do that? Or is he asking us, on a case-by-case, case, individual by individual, you know, make a decision based on what you believe is right, or, which is very respectful, I honor that, we have 14% of our membership that have made that decision, and I respect that fully. Or is it a time in which, um, like in America with Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death? What is going on? Well, for us, it's important to note, most importantly, as President Lincoln said, it doesn't matter if I'm on the winning side or the losing side. I want to be on God's side. Okay? And so when we look at this and we live in this time, it's important that we know because a quarantine and a lockdown is a huge piece. Even though Europe is locked down, the numbers are still off the chart. Okay? It's interesting if you look at that. Some countries are even blaming us and our military men and women, our servicemen who are stationed overseas, is, is because of what's happening on Navy bases. But that's a whole different point. Tonight, guys, the question is, it's really important. If someone says, well, is, is a quarantine biblical? Most people don't know what I'm going to teach here tonight. And so, therefore, you're going to say, well, there's no quarantines in the Bible. If you do that, you ruin your whole witness. If you do that, you don't know what you're talking about. Because there are biblical precedent where God asked people to stay home and not to leave until he gave the word to his prophets, his servants, whether it was Moses, whether it was uh, Isaiah, or any other place in Scripture. So it's important to note, because I've seen a few people in their Facebook posts, and I'm thinking they've ruined it. They're making statements, well, the quarantine's not in the Bible, all this other stuff. And then all you have to do is go, do a quick Google search, is a quarantine in the Bible, and you will find three, at least three very common examples that, yes, it is in the Bible, and God asked his servants and his children to do it. But is he asking us to do it now? If he is, we're all in disobedience because we're here tonight. Personally, I don't believe it one bit that God is asking us to quarantine, and I'm going to explain biblically why I believe it is God who is bringing judgment upon the world. It is a sign of the times that it's centered around life. And I've been talking about that the last two Sunday mornings. Okay. But it's important that we know the scripture so we can explain ourselves. We can articulate to an unlearned or an unknowing world. So we don't simply cause someone to stumble or put our foot in it. Okay. And if you make a statement or if you make a post that quarantines are not biblical, then you're wrong. Now, you can say quarantine, you know, make the statement quarantines are not constitutional. 
There's no precedent in America where government has ever done this. So let me bring the history teacher out here a little bit. All right, don't worry, Faith, no quizzes. I might give it to the adults. All right, but d d constitutionally speaking, we've never done this, whether it's yellow fever, whether it's the Spanish flu, whether it's polio. Government has always left it to the church or the individual business, to the school, whatever. They never force mandates until now. Okay, this is, this is what's different, our First Amendment. So you can make a statement along those lines, but make sure you don't say it's not biblical because there are examples. And I'm going to share two of the three tonight, and I might preach on the third one later, okay, where God makes the declaration for his children to stay home. If you guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's word here tonight. And we're going to start in Exodus chapter 12. I'm going to read a few verses here, jump to Isaiah, a few verses there. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall, make, shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at, or at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, what uh, burn with fire and thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand so you shall eat it in haste it is the Lord's Passover if you jump to verse 29 and it and it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he, all his servants, and all Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And Exodus, I'm sorry, Isaiah 26, verse 20 and 21. Come, my people, enter your chambers, and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood, and no, and no more cover her slain. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word tonight. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. I'm not going to preach expository verse by verse, but we're going to break down some verses tonight and set the stage prior to the exodus of the Egyptian, of, of the Hebrews from Egypt and Pharaoh and Ramesses. And we're going to look at why in the midst of the 10 plagues, and we get to number 10, after number, 11, dar, dar, after number 9, darkness was carried out. And then the tenth would be proclaimed in the death of the firstborn son. Why would God do this? Why would God ask people to stay in their homes and take the blood of a lamb or a goat and put it over the doorpost? So that when he 
came by when he saw blood on that post. He knew that that was a child of God of obedience and therefore their life would be spared. And those lives who were spared, those folks who were quarantined, they could leave after the 10th plague was carried and they could exit and exit Egypt for the first time in 400 years. The people, when they exited, they had just came out of quarantine. What was God doing? God was about to carry. In Scripture, as we just heard, not one Egyptian home was spared. There was at least one death in every home. What is taking place? It is God's judgment. What was the hope in that judgment? As God is judging not only the civilization of Egypt, he's also judging his own because any Hebrew family did not, did not put blood on the doorpost. What happened to them? They died as well. When God gives the quarantine, it is the way out because he is carrying judgment upon a civilization or a people group. So when we look at this place, yes, God is clearly, I believe, bring, I, as I preached last Sunday, as I declared that word last Sunday, talked about it this morning, the prophetic word of God, no doubt about it. If you weren't here, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that message so that you have a full understanding of why that is, you know, at this point of it, name of the game. I believe that God fully is bringing upon judgment against the world in America for the amount of abortion and childhood death in our country and around the world. And guys, guess what? I saw this this week. 75% of, of abortions in the world that are performed in, in countries of this world that are not established, guess who's paying for them? America. Three out of every four. Okay, so this thing, no doubt about it, do I believe what God is doing? Okay, of course, pestilence is a sign of the times as well, such as fires and all uh, uh, civil unrest and all the other things that are prophetic of this day and happening quickly, just as a woman giving birth, the more painful it is until that child is born. All right. And so here we're going to see in Scripture that God gives specific instruction before he brings judgment. He gives specific instruction about the Passover feast. Matter of fact, then he would go on to say is that you should remember the Passover every single year. That's how powerful this thing is. And guess what in Israel? They still do it. When did Jesus institute communion? At Passover. P prior to Constantine putting a 12-month calendar, January and February, Passover was in the first month of the year. Okay? That's the beginning of the year on the Jewish calendar. All right? And so in our Roman calendar, we have January, February, and of course, sometimes Easter is in March, sometimes it is in April. But it is important to note that's the specific guideline of what God was about to do as he is about to free his Hebrew children who have been in slavery, who have been in bondage for 400 years. We're roughly in the year right now, 1300 B.C. God is ready to set them free. But they're going to have to go through a quarantine in their houses and not to pass out of the land until the 10th plague has been carried out, okay? Until the, the plague has been carried out of the death of the firstborn son, then, of course, Pharaoh would say, go, and the exodus would begin. But let's look here at the ingredients of this Passover. It's interesting to see here the blood of a lamb. We sang about the lamb tonight. I would encourage you, on the back wall there, there is a poster that says Christ and the Passover. I would encourage you, because there are so many parallels that Jesus carried out at Passover, not when he was instituting communion, but when he was dying on the cross. So many similarities. Okay, and the sacrifice, a male sheep or goat. Okay, specifically how to cook this at what time of day should this be cooked what time should the blood be put on the doorpost of your houses as you were staying there god was looking for obedience god had spoken this message to his servant moses to declare to the people of israel we have to ask ourselves are the prophets of god are the servants of god declaring on behalf of god for us to quarantine or are we hearing 
Well, we need to do what the CDC reports, we need to do what the governors say, and we must honor authority. Who is the source of our quarantine? That's the first talking point tonight. Yes, a quarantine is, there is a biblical precedent, but is the quarantine coming from God? I would encourage you to ask God that question. I would encourage you to study that, think about that. Well, here, this quarantine that is authentic and from God is very specific. And for the people to stay in their homes until twilight and to eat. And it's important to note, do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire. Very specific instructions. God is very specific. What do we see happening today in America? We don't see the church even unified about this topic. We, see, we don't see all 50 states unified about this topic. We don't see even in the states that are closed off that's unified. Okay, we are looking at, okay, but I can tell you, if I believe fully that God was bringing humankind into a quarantine, I would be at home. I would be at home. I don't believe that's what God is doing. God is coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. It's really tough to evangelize and be light at home. I don't believe that's happening, but I do believe God is judging. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're to stay at home. Now, what's important here is, verse 12, I just want to read this. For I will pass through the land in Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on, will not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The Lord had a specific purpose, but the blood was about redemption. What redeems us? The blood of Jesus. The lamb who was slain, we sang about it above all. But as the plague is being carried out, the refuge, the reason God told them to stay home, because if they were not home, they would suffer. One of the plagues, ultimately, of course, but especially this plague. God, even if they were home, if they didn't put blood on the doorpost, they would suffer the consequence of this plague. Think about that. Could you imagine? That's a high price, the death of your firstborn son. Pastor Drew, that would be Drew. Troy? That would be Josh. Mom, that'd be Steve. Randy and Andy, that'd be Jake. That's a high price. Who's the first for you guys? Who's your first? I forget. Dan. All right. Yeah, that's a high price. That's a, that's a high price. But God gave specific instruction to his servants. His servants. And it's important here as we look at this and as we understand God's timing and his plan, as we understand what God is doing. Back to verse 29, and it came to pass at, at midnight, at twilight, at midnight, when, the, when things would, when people would be going to bed, when things would be quiet, God would move his hand. God would move his hand. Think about it. This year, COVID came up pretty quick, didn't it? Remember March 8th, all we were worried about was losing an hour of sleep because we were springing forward. We had no idea. We're getting ready to go. Think, guys, we've been in this thing 10 months. 10 months. Okay, things happening quickly. Things happening when everything seemed to be pretty quiet. When 9-11, when our when our gate to America was penetrated. Things were pretty quiet that morning. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was teaching mentally ill teenagers at that time at a place called Pathways, okay? And, and not far, not far from the Pentagon. Not far. And I remember that morning like it was literally yesterday. It was a very scary time for us. My father worked in the nuclear power plant, and they had to go into lockdown because they were worried that might get hit. 
My brother, he's working in the Heritage Foundation at the time before he worked on Capitol Hill, and that was a scary thing. But that morning was quiet. He thought everything was great in America. But we had our gate penetrate, and it's been 19 years since then. But it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of livestock. So anybody that did not have blood on the doorpost, when God began to move, if they were not, yes, they were in quarantine, but they had specific, oh, they had specific instructions for that time. And it wasn't a lot of time between the ninth plague and the tenth plague. It wasn't a lot of time. It wasn't, okay, we're looking at 10 months in lockdown, okay, or six months or three months or two months, okay? And so here, the, as, the, as the 10th plague was being carried out, Moses records here for us very quick, whether it was the captive, whether it was the firstborn of Pharaoh, whether it was any livestock, it did not matter. God was moving. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house there that one was not dead. Interesting. Interesting. But when we look at the Exodus, most people don't know that when the Exodus happened, the Exodus started in quarantine, which I'm going to read here in just a second. Now, some would say, well, in these last days, maybe leading up to the rapture, we're going to be raptured out of quarantine. That doesn't make sense. The Great Commission, plus the writer of Hebrews says, forsake not the fellowship of the brethren, even more so as the day approaches. It doesn't make, politi it doesn't make biblical prophetic sense for us to be in a state of quarantine and the rapture happening. Okay? However, here it makes perfect sense. So when we look at quarantine being biblical and being for today, we have to understand, is God's fingerprint behind it, or is there too many steps of confusion? Well, here, it's very clear to me, God had a specific purpose. God was very clear, spoke through his word. And when God is judging, by the way, the book of Amos tells us that God will always reveal his secrets to the prophets first. And I don't hear that coming out of many churches. I don't hear it at all. Verse 31, then I want to shift to Assyria 500 years later. Then he called for Moses and Aaron, Oin by night, and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. So what does he say? Rise and get up out of quarantine. Don't stay in this place. This is now your time to leave. I have brought the judgment. It was done quickly. Now arise and go. Get out of this place. Flee Egypt. The Exodus story must begin. The examples in Scripture where God brought a quarantine, it was not a prolonged thing. It was simply to spare the righteous with specific instruction so he could bring judgment upon a civilization. So it's important to note the biblical examples of quarantine, but how to understand if God's fingerprint is upon it or not. Arise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said, and take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they may send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneaded bowls, bound up their clothes on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given favor and sight of the Egyptians, so they granted them what they requested. They also plundered the Egyptians. They left. The Exodus story started from quarantine. They left at that point, and that's when they would begin traveling into the wilderness. And, of course, we know the Red Sea crossing story. But most don't know that it started 
in a quarantine called by God. If we jump 500 years from 1300 to 750 B.C., we're going to see in Isaiah chapter 8 a prophetic word by God given to Isaiah to give to King Ahaz that Assyria will invade the land, penetrate the city, and conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. Prophetic word. We know in Scripture, as God would honor that, this is roughly 750 by 722, is when Assyria would conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. It's interesting. I want to share this. This is after uh, God declares the child shall be born, uh, a savior unto us, a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder. I preach verse 6. Uh, earlier at the Christmas season, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But I want to read tonight verse number 10. And this is huge leading up to the passage in Isaiah that we stood for. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild them with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with seed. God was declaring exactly what the people of Israel would state. As Assyria would come in and conquer the land and, and, and then fully do it by 722, that the sycamores, they represent, and the bricks represents, the bricks represent the blessing of God upon Israel, especially during King David's reign. However, the people of Israel, they thought they could build it back better. And we're going to come back with hewn stones, and we're going to come back with cedar, and we're going to come back bigger and better than we were before, and we're going to do it on our own strength. You know what? After 9-11, that's what we said we would do. We would come back bigger and better. Do you know that every tree that they tried to plant at ground zero has not grown but died immediately since 9-11. Every tribute they tried to put there. And to the, to the scientists, they can't understand it. But what President Bush declared on 2001, President Obama declared ten, in 2011, 10 years after the 9-11 attack at the anniversary, the 10th anniversary, is that we will come back bigger and better. And both presidents had the nerve to the, quote this verse. But they don't understand the context of the verse. The context of the verse was God was bringing judgment upon the northern kingdom of Israel because they were mocking God, declaring that they could come back bigger and better without his influence. Heaven help us in America if we think we can be bigger and better without the favor of God. Hey, Pastor, why are you saying that? Well, because God, when it came to the people of Assyria, when they came on the scene after they penetrated the gates in roughly 750, 748, somewhere in there, by 722, the whole northern kingdom would be conquered. But before that would happen, God instituted a quarantine. Isaiah 26, verse 20. Come, my people, enter your chambers. Shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. He ordered, God ordered through Isaiah to inform the people of the northern kingdom of Israel, not in Judah now, this is the northern kingdom of Israel. This is after Solomon and his sons and Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the kingdom is divided. The northern kingdom of Israel, come my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself as if it were for a little moment. Almost sounds like Jesus in Matthew 24 as the tribulation judgments are carried out. What does he say? Run to the hills. Save yourself. 
Woe to the nursing mother. Okay, Jesus was calling a quarantine, but up in the hills. Okay, because it was going to be so. He even said it would be better to be in Sodom and Gomorrah than on the earth during that time of tribulation, especially the great tribulation where the seal, the trumpet, and the bowl judgments are carried out prior to the second coming of Christ. But this is important to note, that God in the midst of his judgments, he gave them a remedy for salvation. And that remedy was a quarantine. Why? As the indignation is passing. Can you imagine how that broke God's heart to have to raise up the Assyrian people? Now, God had told King Ahaz 20 years, you know, at the time before the northern kingdom uh, gate would be penetrated for them to repent and turn to him. But they didn't do that. They didn't do that. And God had to bring about judgment, indignation. But because of God's covenant with Abraham and his love for his people, he told them to quarantine. Now, you may be saying, well, maybe God is bringing judgment upon America and he's telling us to quarantine. If that's the conviction you have, you've been in prayer. God laid that on your heart. We'll certainly stay home and lock down. But I don't believe that's the consensus. Again, as I referred to earlier, I don't believe the Lord and his word would tell us to forsake not the fellowship of the brother and even more so as the day approaches. However, if you believe that and some people do, maybe someone watching right now, I respect that. I honor that. That's roll with it. Follow your conviction. But I want us to understand why it is significant for us to know why God called a quarantine. Because he was going to stand aside and let his people be conquered. Not annihilated and defeated forever, but let his people be conquered. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. God certainly would judge the Assyrian people as well for their annihilation of Israel, but God permitted them. God would judge the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Persians, the Romans right throughout, even the Europeans who were in control of Israel prior to their rebirth in 1948. But the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. Any time God brought about a quarantine, it was to judge the sin of humankind. I want to get serious, though, with you here for a second. And I'm going to preach this, the full sermon, at Sanctity of Life Sunday, which is January 17th, the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. And it's going to be huge this year because um, 50 years since abortion became legal in New York, 47 years became it became the law of the land in America in 1973, January of 19th. Some of you remember when the Supreme Court ruled that. It was before I was born, but some of you here remember it very well. However, when God brought judgment to the southern kingdom, the holy city of Jerusalem, when its wall was penetrated by King Nebuchadnezzar in 605 B.C., and 19 years later, would the whole southern kingdom would be conquered, what What sin was going on in these respective kingdoms of God? The murder of innocent children who were being sacrificed and killed because of idolatry and worshipers of Baal and all the other things that were going on that influenced Israel. Matter of fact, think about Solomon. He even married the queen of Sheba. Do you know they had children together? Do you know that there are some who believe that it was it was the Queen of Sheba, Solomon's wife, that took the Ark of the Covenant and buried it in Ethiopia? That's where some people believe it's buried. Some also believe that's a counterfeit, but it does. The bottom line is that's how that's how the story is because Solomon was became so unrighteous, and his the result was a couple generations later, children were being killed. And guys, I don't want to get too graphic tonight because there's children here. But I don't want anybody to think just because 
abortion became illegal in 1970 in New York, then the whole country in 1973. But people been doing dark side abortion long before a doctor ever did it in a hospital room. But even, think about it. Back to Moses real quick. What did Pharaoh, what was he doing with baby boys? Killing them. Why did Moses' mother have to put him in a basket and send him down the river? Jesus, Herod, had baby boys up to the age of two killed. But this would be the people of Israel, God's people. Who would have ever thought in America we would be killing our babies? And then paying for three out of four abortions abroad? That's amazing to me. God would be so upset. Stay home until the indignation passes. But I just feel led to read verse 1 of chapter 27. In that day, the Lord, with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, the twisted serpent. And he, God, will slay the reptile that is in the sea. In that day of judgment, we certainly know as we've been studying in Revelation, the Lord is going to be victorious. We read the verse tonight of Jesus on his white horse. But I just want to encourage everyone tonight is that the Lord will have vindication over those who have been killed. Over the iniquity of the earth, the inhabitants of the earth. And right now, in the midst of what we see happening, 136 years after America's civil war, when we were divided, it was 136 years between the captivity of the di division, the, the conquering of the northern kingdom and southern kingdom, first by Assyria, then Babylon, 136 years between the two. 136 years between our civil war and 9-11. At the 50th anniversary of New York, Albany, declaring abortion to be legal in the first state, 1970. Well, getting back to quarantine as we finish tonight, remember Sunday night's been using to equip the saints to understand so we can have better understanding of what is going on in the world. Notice we haven't talked about anything pertaining to public safety. We haven't talked about anything pertaining to the government calling a quarantine. The quarantine that God gave to the Hebrew people after the ninth plague and before the Passover feast and before the tenth plague was carried out was not given by Pharaoh, it was given by God. Here, when God warned King Ahaz through the prophet Isaiah about the upcoming attack of Assyria that would be carried out finally in 722, and God gives the declaration for people to run and enter their chambers and shut the doors and hide themselves for a, a little moment until indignation passed, that did not come from King Ahaz. That did not come from Hezekiah. That did not come from some righteous king. That did not come from the people of Syria. That came from God. So I ask you tonight, is God asking us to quarantine today? I ask tonight, when we look at a time in which our Lord is about to return, I believe it's more likely the adversary would love Christians to stay home, therefore not being salt and light in the most horrific time in world history. Church, spend time to seek the face of the living God. My daughter's memory verse today blessed my heart when she shared it to me from Isaiah. She might even have that with her tonight. A little cute little craft that they did in the kindergarten, first and second grade class this morning. Seek the face of God while he may be found. Talk to the Lord. See what God is doing. Don't make the mistake 
because we all know right now in many states in our union, our leaders are not reigning righteousness. Matter of fact, some of our governors, including our own, as well as perhaps the 46th president of the United States, Joe Biden, should he be elected, joining the statements of Governor Cuomo of New York, saying, we don't need God, we basically we need science. We need to come together as a people and defeat this thing. If those people, if those people make the statement to quarantine and it's not the will of God, it can only be the end. There's not an in-between. Tonight, if there was a biblical preference for a quarantine by God in any other way for public safety reasons, I would be the first to quote it to you, to give you an understanding. But church, as we connect the dots, as we look at life, as we live in 2021, we still have a great commission. We still have the command of God and his word to be salt and light. But I want to finish with this, another prophetic verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, and then we'll pray and dismiss tonight. But concerning the times and the seasons, referring to the day of the Lord, Brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. When they say, when the world says peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of night or nor darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ to die for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are doing. That doesn't sound like a quarantine to me. Be careful of peace and safety, and that's all we hear today. Be safe. Peace. But Jesus' servant, the Apostle Paul, he knew the prophetic sign. We now see this global prophetic sign. The question is, will we be watching and sober and alert, or instead, will we be contrary to that? Well, may we comfort one another with these words tonight. Understanding a quarantine. Understanding peace and safety. Understanding the signs of the time. So we can live for our Lord. Declaring the gospel of Jesus while it is still day. The question is, are you ready to do that? Do not be deceived. Be aware of the scripture. Be aware of what and why Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun. Let's be looking up. Our redemption draweth nigh. Let's be watching and waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. And let's be doing it together. As was said this morning, when we come together, 
for the glory of God, for the gift of prophecy to be manifested, for souls to be won, for miracles to take place. When we come together, may we come together with a desire to praise the glorious name of Jesus and a desire to win souls while it is still day. Father, I thank you for your word from the book of Exodus, from the book of Isaiah, from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonian church, to the other verses that were referred to tonight, such as there's nothing new under the sun, from the book of Ecclesiastes. Lord God, or Hebrews 10.25, forsake not the fellowship, even more so as the day referring to the return of your Son, Jesus Christ, approaches. Lord God, I pray that we will have a biblical mindset. I pray that we will have a biblical understanding, a historical understanding, Lord, of how you operate in the precedent that you follow. And Lord, you're following the same exact path of your word because that is your nature. But Lord, maybe there's someone here tonight or someone watching that is not aware of your conduct and your character, not aware of how you operate, not aware, Lord God, of a specific instruction, not aware of what America was formed on, which is the freedoms the inalienable rights of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given to every American citizen. Lord God, I pray if there's someone here tonight that does not know you as Lord and Savior, on this third day of January of 2021, Lord, that they'll cry out your name. Lord God, that they are convinced, Father, after you reveal the Son to them tonight, that they need a Savior. For, Lord, just as you judged Egypt, just as you judged Assyria, Lord, you ultimately judged your own people for 2,800 years because of their iniquity. All the way, Lord, from 722 with Assyria taking the northern kingdom, all the way to 1948, other nations were in control of the Holy Land. But, Lord, for the last... 72 years the dry bones are living in Israel again just as your servant Ezekiel said they were but Lord may America repent Lord I know there might be one of our representatives in Augusta watching tonight or our senators watching tonight they check out the services Lord God I pray that America, that Maine, that PAG will repent of our sin. Lord, I pray we'll be like Daniel and intercede for each other as fellow Americans, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ while it is still time. But Lord, we can't pray those things and be those people unless we first know you personally. If you're here tonight and you'd like to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, admit you're a sinner. Therefore, admit you need the Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can blot out your sin. You can do that by believing that he suffered on the cross and shed his blood to bring about your forgiveness. And believe that on the third day, he got up out of the grave, proving that he is the Savior of the world. Confess with your mouth. And Jesus called people publicly. If you need Christ, I invite you to come tonight. If you're watching on Facebook, you can write in the comment section, I want to give my life to Christ, and someone will pray with you, and I'll follow up with you this week. Someone will pray with you tonight. Just put it in the comment section. Tonight, the, now is the day of salvation. If you're here tonight, and you want your equipping to be enhanced, to grow, I invite you to come and talk to the Lord tonight. If you're here tonight and you have a question about this sermon and you want to talk to God about the context, come and talk to Him. Don't wait till tomorrow morning. Come and talk to Him tonight. We still have time. If you're here tonight and you're sitting there thinking, Lord, you judged Egypt, you judged Assyria, you judged your own people. 
America will be no different. And you want to come stand in the gap for the country that we love. God told Solomon in his prayer, 2 Chronicles 7, 15, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face, turn from their wicked way, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. If they don't, I will bring about pestilence, and I will bring about drought, I will bring about fire, I will bring about disease, and I will bring about civil unrest. Everything that we've seen this past year. But God in his mercy has given us an opportunity. May we be like his equal, be found standing in the gap tonight. If that's you, I invite you to come. Let's take a moment to seek the Lord while he may be found tonight. In Jesus' name. Spirit, come make us humble. Return our eyes when we look at a world cast down and out of
Spirit, come make us humble. We turn around from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. So give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us now lift our soul to another. So give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our soul to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that sees. Seek your face, Lord Jacob. Oh God, let us be a generation that sees. Six hours. Oh God of Jesus. Why don't we stand as we close? Let's sing that together tonight. Hallelujah. Give us clean hands, Lord, tonight. We bow our hearts. We bow our Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. So give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift us up to another. So give us clean hands and give us pure heart. Let us not lift us up to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks. Seek your face, oh God of Jacob. Oh God, let us be. A generation that seeks, seeks your face, O God of Jacob. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. O Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. So give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our soul to another. So give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Your face, oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be a generation that sees. Seek your face, oh God of Jacob, oh God of Jacob. Lord God, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for instruction. How to recognize you, Lord. For example, I think of when you declare for the great tribulation for the, the people of that day to run to the hills. When you declare, woe is the pregnant woman. It would be better to be in Sodom than in the, the world during the tribulation period. Lord, you're so specific for what we're supposed to do, even in the midst of your judgment. And Lord, that includes the day that we live in. And the scripture, that pertains to it, Lord. So we can recognize your voice. And Lord, you said 
in the book of John that the sheep know the voice of their shepherd. So, Lord, I pray that voice be loud and clear to us. And may we be obedient to your word just as the Hebrews were obedient to Moses when he declared your word about the Passover. Or to Isaiah when he declared to the people of the northern kingdom of Israel as Assyria was coming to bring forth a complete conquering of that kingdom. Lord, you were specific in the instruction. It wasn't to be something permanent. It would be even for a night as the tenth plague was carried out. Or even for a short season as the Assyrians came in and and judgment was taking place. And of course, you would raise up the Babylonians to conquer not only the southern kingdom of Judah, but they also conquered the Assyrians with Nebuchadnezzar. But Lord, you wanted to spare your children, and you gave instruction to cling to, to stay and hide in the chambers. But Lord, today, Lord God, may we live for you as salt and light. May we come together and forsake not the fellowship of the brethren, even as some are doing more so as the day approaches. Lord God, equip your children. Equip me as the under-shepherd of this congregation to leave in 2021. And may we see a revival. Lord, may we do what Israel wasn't able to do for 2,800 years. And that's repent. And Lord, there's very few pieces of sand left. Very few pieces. Lord God, may we stand in the gap for this country that we love, this country we call home, the United States of America. Father God, on Wednesday will be a huge day in Capitol Hill. State legislatures have 10 days to go into crisis mode if debate is heard and votes are taken and there could be limbo this week but Father God your will be done as the Constitution is tested and carried out but Father God whatever may happen may we as the branch stay connected to the vine and may we declare the truth of your love the truth of the gospel and of your second coming and may we be reminded for such a time as this as Mordecai told Esther we have been called and may we be light for you. Bless us now with travel and mercies, Lord. Watch over us, protect us, bring rest to our body tonight as we prepare to go back to work and regular routine. The kids and young people go back to school this week, Lord. We have several teachers in the here, Lord God. Bless us as we return to school after a Christmas break. And for us at OHCA, it's been a month 